Hello, BioSci 101. Here we are finally at resolution, the grand finale, sort of. There's a little more beyond this, but um, this is where we put it all together and um, where you finally, I think, really truly deeply understand images um, once you dig through this material. So again, BioSci 101, Spring 2021. This is Dr. Georgie, Lecture 14, Resolution. Here we go. So um, these are the topics that I'm going to cover. This is a nice, dense, nutritious meal, if you wish. Um, and um, some of it is, are things you've heard of before. And some are things that are brand new. So um, let's dive in. We're I'm going to remind you about the refractive index, and then we're going to talk a little bit about diffraction and in specifically airy discs. And um, then we're going to get to the star of the show, which is NA, numerical aperture on objectives. Um, and we're going to put it all together, and you'll know how resolution happens in your scopes, which is kind of the point of the scopes, right? So in, if you have the Murphy-Davidson text, um, these are some places you will find this information. So let's go back to the very beginning. This is the very first thing that we discussed. Microscopes, what are they good for? <laughs> um, and then I, I basically always say, well, let me let me start by what they're what is not the point of a microscope. It is not in a really expensive magnifying glass. OK, it's just not even though people view it that way. Um, if you need a magnifying glass, get a magnifying glass. They're super cheap and they'll just make what you can already see a little bit bigger. Cool. Nothing against them. That is not why microscopes <laughs> exist. Um, and you might remember I gave you this example that you have now done by this lecture. You, you've done this at home. When you went to make your cheek cells, um, you perhaps were like, did I get anything? I mean, I see maybe a little saliva. Are there any cheek cells in there? Who knows? There was some transparent stuff on transparent glass with a transparent cover slip unless and until you added methyl and blue <laughs> so you, you could add some contrast. But um, think of if you hadn't stained them, it would have just been transparent stuff on transparent glass. And if you magnify that, you would see a bigger version of nothing, basically. <laughs> you would still not be able to see your cheek cells. It would, they would still be transparent, only apparently larger. Your slide and cover slip will look larger, but you could already see those. You're not gaining any info, right? Um, so it comes down to resolution and uh, I thought I had the ex an extra slide in here, uh, but basically, as you know, microscopes are about resolution and contrast. So you can get both from a microscope. You are always getting resolution on every microscope. The question is how much resolution and what kind of resolution and so on. Um, and you are sometimes usually getting contrast either because the microscope itself provides it through the optics or more frequently really because you've prepared the specimen to give the contrast. For example, with the cheek cells, um, you can view unstained cheek cells on a phase or DIC scope, no problem. You don't have to stain them. If you're using regular bright field or fluorescence or something else, you're gonna have to stain them. Phase and DIC are contrast generating techniques. Fluorescence and um, regular bright field rely on the specimen prep to give the contrast. But again, in all cases, it's the microscope that gives you the resolution. So in this program, in this course, we have been dealing with optical resolution. In other words, light microscopes, microscopes that use light as the probe. Um, you can also use electrons as the probe, and that's an electron microscope, so a TEM or an SEM. 
um, in case I didn't say it already, uh, our SEM requires an additional part <laughs> to our surprise in order to let you, uh, to let us have you remote control it. So um, you're just gonna, in this class, just gonna have to come in and do hands-on next semester with it, which is really fun. Um, so this is just an example of, you know, this is great resolution for a light microscope on the left. This is a little thing. I think this is a little diatom, little um, chalky calcium -y crit cages that the critters inside make, the diatoms themselves make these little cages that are lovely to look at. We have some. You can bring in diatomaceous earth and look at it. Looks just like this under the EM and pretty much just like that under the regular scope. And um, diatoms are used a lot <laughs> to, as a resolution um, guides or just to check how good your resolution is. Now there's a thing, if the resolution of your screen isn't that good, you're not going to see a difference between these two images. <laughs> and in fact, when I teach at school, I can see it on my own computer screen right now. I'm like, they're not that much, the one on the right is not that much better. But if you look carefully, you'll see that there's a lot of dots everywhere. There's a tiny fine structure that you can see by having um, the right illumination. So um, magnification, it cannot overcome low resolution. There's no substitute. What you want is resolution. Magnification is just, it happens to come along for the ride, really. Because if reality is there are two structures, but your scope sees only one structure, then you're only going to see one structure, no matter how much you magnify it, you're going to still miss information. Um, we talked about, I think in the first lecture, about my sort of image of Martians looking down. I uh, imagine we were gathered in a classroom and the Martians are trying to figure out how many humans they are. And maybe they can only tell, like, there's human in a classroom. There's a room and there's human. Is it one? Is it 30? Is it 12? They don't know. They can't resolve that. Uh, we obviously can resolve and go like, I can count exactly how many humans are in this classroom. But especially if the humans are sort of near to each other, it's hard to tell um, them apart and to count them. So that's exactly what we're doing, except um, Obviously, our eyes can see humans. We can resolve one human from another, but we can't resolve one part of a cell from another. In fact, we can't even resolve one cell from another because cells are, to be able to see individual cells, that's below the resolution limit of our eyes. We can obviously see lots and lots of cells together. <laughs> that's anything, that's us when we look at our skin. Oh, oh, hey, look at all those cells. Well. You see skin, if you put it under a microscope, um, you can see that there's individual cells. Same thing when you look at a plant or an insect, anything else. Okay, so here's the slide I was looking for earlier. What do microscopes actually do if they're not magnifying glasses? They resolve, they give you resolution, which is everything. It's what makes them so amazing and why um, we're able to see things on them and use them to search for life on other planets. If you haven't listened to the SM, uh, San Francisco Microscopy Society, SFMS, yeah, um, talk from last week um, on uh, search for life on other planets using microscopes, it's well worth it. It was amazing. Um, we figure that movement of a certain kind is a signature of life. And so um, they're making plans to send uh, scopes out in space and explore uh, other planets and see if we can find some sort of microbial like life. Because remember, this planet is mostly microbes for most of its history and still most of the bulk of life on this planet are uh, things that are living organisms that you can only see with a microscope. We didn't know they existed until we invented microscopes. And then we're surprised to see things dashing and darting around. And um, then we realized that there, were, there was all this life around us that we couldn't see. And we're still discovering what's out there. In the talk, uh, the Jay Nadu who does this, she goes everywhere, all over our planet currently and eventually other planets <laughs> through robots. Um, but finding 
uh, little bits of life in the harshest environments, pretty much everywhere you look, if you look hard enough with a good enough microscope and you know what you're doing, you'll find a little bit of life there, which is pretty amazing. So let's all contribute to solving climate change so we can keep going. Otherwise, it's just going to be microbes again. Okay, so microscopes, they resolve, they they generate contrast sometimes. I mean, and they generate a little too anyway, um, if you're using your eye diaphragm uh, well. But the predominant thing they do is resolve. And again, contrast comes from the scope, yeah, depending on the kind of scope, but also very much the specimen prep. And yeah, sure, they do magnify things. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to magnify things. I'm just saying that's not their essence or not the real magic of what they do, so to speak, magic science, whatever. The real cool thing, the really useful thing that they do is they create resolution. So let's remember what we learned about the refractive index this semester, because <laughs> it's going to tie into resolution. And uh, refraction makes a huge difference uh, to, towards resolution. So refraction itself is just a physical phenomenon. Physics people have figured this out. And when you uh, follow light and you're observing what it does, you realize that when it goes from one type of material into another type of material, so we call that a medium, um, it often bends. And it bends if these mediums, these materials, have a different refractive index. And in general, if it's a dense element, it's um, going to slow down the light. And that means it has a higher refractive index. So the speed of light is not constant. There is, it, it is really fast. C is the speed of light, super, super fast. Um, it's so fast that it's not really significant how much slower things make it because it's ultra fast or so whatever. But it's significant because and it's not a big issue in terms of like, oh my God, my optic cable is slowing down, uh, optic fiber, whatever. It's more about, at least for us, it's about the fact that the rays are distorted. And so they're distorted as they go through different uh, mediums. And in our case, we're trying to avoid too much refraction. We're trying to make everything be the same refractive index as much as we possibly can so that we don't have to lose um, resolution because of the refractive index of what we're dealing with. And so the refractive index is um, basically uh, how much slow slower it is because of you know whatever it's the light is passing through and there's no um, there's no units for it because it's speed of vacuum just, uh, divided by the speed in the medium and it's um, wavelength dependent and so here are generally speaking the refractive indices for things that we care about. Um, so in a vacuum, you've seen a more accurate representation of this uh, previously, but let's just say it's one. <laughs> in air, it's kind of one too. It's, it's actually a little slower than a vacuum, but fundamentally, just for our own remembering purposes, it's, it's one because we're biologists. Um, in water, it's about 1.33. In glass, 1.5. In immersion oil, that's made specifically for microscopes, 1.5. It's made to match the glass. Um, it would be nice if glass could be made to match the water, but it just doesn't. Uh, this is the best we can do with, you know, the, the best techniques for making optical glass. Um, and water is what most living biological organisms or even dead and fixed organisms are made of. So our specimens in biology usually have a refractive index that is close to water, but in, in actuality, they have different parts are gonna have different refractive indices. And that's gonna lead you actually to phase, um, that's how phase contrast and DIC imaging work is they take advantage of that and give you a map of the refractive index of your specimen. But while we're just generalizing, we say our specimen, because it's biological, is probably close to 1.33, which is water, close-ish. Okay, that's refraction. 
there's also diffraction that happens when light bounces around the universe. And um, when light is flowing around the world, the planet, the universe, it sometimes runs into a situation where there's a block and then there's a tiny hole that it can squeeze through. So we call that an aperture. And in this case, we're gonna think about light being a wave. And here's a nice straight wave. The light is all just traveling. It's, it's all traveling through one medium. So air, water, whatever the blue thing is on the left, in the example on the left. And it's just traveling along, bam, it hits an obstacle. It cannot tra travel through those pink, brown, barriers, but it can th travel through the hole in the middle. What you see as the light comes out on the other side is a diffraction pattern, this fanned out pattern. And so both of these drawings are the same in the same example. It's light hitting a barrier and then there's a hole that it can go through. And so the wave gets disrupted. You can see this in the ocean too, or you can make your own, you know, to little diffraction chamber at home, just take a container of some sort, square container, rectangular container, and, and put some fluid in there, put a barrier, watch it go through the barrier. You'll see this pattern. It's pretty cool. Okay, so this is a famous diffraction pattern. Um, this is when you shine a laser pointer through a mesh, through a square, like for instance, if anybody has them, uh, uh, what are those, uh, pantyhose are, are great for doing this experiment. Or in lab, we use the Bunsen burner, a little uh, grid, um, and I shine a laser through it. So this is, if you look at diffraction, you'll see people showing examples of this. And you can even hold up two colors and see that they have different diffraction patterns. This is lovely, but um, this is going, this is a square hole, so a square aperture. In microscopy, we don't encounter this kind of diffraction pattern because we're dealing with round holes. So I'm going to come to that in a little bit. But you know, like <laughs> inside the cell, this might be happening, possibly. Square is kind of an unusual shape for biology. This is just another example um, of diffraction. It, it also happens when, I mean, basically if there's a barrier in the way of the wave, at the edge, there's gonna be a diffraction pattern. So you're seeing an orange barrier in the middle here, which is, I guess, a penny. And then you're seeing the light waves bend around the edge. And if you can you know, have a screen at a certain point, you're getting an image. So um, hopefully this is leading you <laughs> to thinking about, hmm, image, you get an image, really? Diffraction patterns give you an image? Yeah, they do. And in fact, famously, there was this two slit um, exper experiment, uh, Young's double slit experiment, which you can also replicate yourself. Um, where let's think about what happens if there's two holes, two apertures. So here's the light wave coming down and, and through each hole, you're gonna get that distinctive um, fan shape pattern, diffraction pattern. But now those two diffraction patterns are right next to each other. And what happens in the zone and the areas where they overlap Basically, if you shine a light through two slits, you're not going to see a light on the other side. You're, you're not going to see a point of light. You're going to see stripes. You're going to see stripes as at the bottom of here. So it's called fringes, but it's basically stripes. Um, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, why is that happening? And why do we care microscopy? We'll get there in a second. But what's going on? And the reason that you get stripes is you're getting what's known as constructive and destructive interference between the waves. So this is well named. It's exactly like what it sounds like. So the waves interfere with each other. As you know, before you had one wave going along, just great. And then you hit it with two holes, obstacle and only two ways to get through. And then Suddenly, there's um, there there's all kind of 
uh, stuff happening. And it may look confusing, but it's actually happening in a very organized mathematical way, which is lovely. I'm laughing because I'm thinking about what if, like imagine 300 people trying to get out of um, a room and there's only two small doors and they're all trying to, let's say they were not even a room, there's a wall um, for no reason. <laughs> as walls often are, <laughs> but anyway, there's 300 people walking, you know, 10 rows of 10 people are walking beautifully in sync, you know, everything, I don't know, American marching band or something. And then they hit a wall and there's only two small doors they can get through one at a time. And they're gonna come out, not in a marching band, you know, 10 people in a row, 10 rows deep, whatever uh, kind of pattern, right? They're gonna come out fanning out. And if um, this was some silly movie or something, there'd be trampling and people increasing in height. Anyway, I may be confusing you with this analogy and I apologize, if so just ignore it. But here's the thing, what waves do when they come out of those two holes that are next to each other is wherever two waves um, coincide and are both, um, in the up energy kind of part of the wave. Because remember waves, the energy fluctuates, right? It's up and then it's down, it's up and then it's down. So if two waves are both, let's just say up, um, they are going to add, um, the, the energy will be twice in that point. So instead of, so that's constructive interference, like you see on the um, left-hand side of the, of the figure here, those two waves are both up at the same time and the resulting wave is double the original wave. So they add their energy. So lots of energy plus lots of energy equals twice the energy. <laughs> you know, It's really simple math, it's A plus B. <laughs> so whatever the energy of wave A is and whatever the energy of wave B is, as long as they're both in the same phase, um, in other words, they're both up at the same time, you'll get um, an increased amplitude. Remember amplitude is the brightness or the intensity. So if um, it's bright plus bright, you'll get brighter. On the right-hand side, you see what happens if the waves don't coincide with each other and one is bright and the other one is dark at that point. Um, basically the darkness and the brightness Will, the darkness will subtract from their brightness and you'll get darker. So you'll get dimness. Again, it's A plus C, but uh, so it's the first wave plus the second wave, but the second wave is negative. <laughs> this is like, you know, if you're around somebody you're in a great mood, they're in a terrible mood, they bring you down. Same thing. If the wave is super bright and the other one is dim, then the, the sum, the new wave, the new thing in that spot, the new thing that you could image will be dimmer. So that's destructive interference. So you take a bright wave, you give it a wave that happens to be in its dim phase at that point, at that same point, and you'll get dimness. You take a bright wave and in the same point in space and time, you have another wave trying to fit in there and it's also bright, then you'll get a twice as bright wave. Okay, so looking back, now that you've sort of seen this, it's it's one part of physics that I think is really nice because it's super intuitive. It's like bright and bright makes brighter and bright and dark makes darker, <laughs> dimmer. <laughs> you know, I think that we kind of experience that in the world in general, right? If you have two bright lights, the room is brighter. If you have a bright light and not a bright light, then it's dimmer. Um, so you can see they're drawing, um, they're drawing these lines through the wave patterns to show you that what you're going to see as the image, if you put a screen um, at a certain point, you're going to get super bright, dimmer, dimmer, dimmest, a little less dim, a little less dim, super bright, dimmer, dimmer, dimmest, a little less dim, a little less dim, brightest, you know, so you're going to get um, stripes, as I call them, or fringes, as they're more properly called. Okay, so this is all to lead us to this fantastic definition of microscopy. I'm pausing in awe. 
<laughs> no, seriously, every time I, I teach this part, um, it's just beautiful. So this is Ernst Abbey, one of the founders of microscopy. Um, he was involved with Zeiss, and it was in the 1800s in Europe where there was that first, you know, wave of, well, I would say in the 1600s, it was like, ooh, microscopy was invented. And then the 1800s was like, ooh, now we can really do really super cool stuff. And then um, in the last 20 years, we're in another renaissance, thanks to GFP, and then a lot of um, new microscopes coming around uh, because of that. So um, Ernst Abbey defined what microscopy is and how we get images just really beautifully. It was actually a footnote <laughs> in one of his manuscripts, but um, it is the definition. If somebody ever asks you, what does a microscope do? Why, you know, like this is the answer to like it's not a magnifying glass what is it this is what it is um this is what the image is so the microscope image is the interference effect of a diffraction phenomenon i'm gonna say it again the microscope image is the interference effect of a diffraction phenomenon. The image that you see with your eyes or with a camera, thanks to running light through your specimen, through the objective, through the condenser first, that image is an image in the first place. <laughs> There is something to see, as opposed to magnifying glass, there is something to see because diffraction happened. And that diffraction led to interference, constructive and negative. And what you are seeing is the destructive and constructive interference pattern of your specimen. So I'm going to say that again. What you are seeing in the microscope is the constructive and destructive interference pattern of your specimen, that were the, the pattern that is created by shining light through your specimen. Or in the case of reflected microscopy like fluorescence, the pattern that is created by shining light at your specimen and then collecting the light. So technically, maybe I should say it's the pattern of the collected light that is coming off your uh, microscope. But you see something as opposed to nothing because there's diffraction happening. And therefore, you get a lovely interference pattern. <laughs> In the case of the two slit experiment, the image is stripes, right? It's a series of fringes. OK, stripes, fringes, whatever you want to call it. That's the image. In the case of a more complicated specimen than just some, a piece of a board with two holes in it, that's your specimen. OK, whatever. That was exciting in the 1600s to look at. Um, still exciting today because it's interesting, but we want fancier specimens. So let's, um, you know, put whatever it is we're going to put under the microscope, and we're still going to get an interference effect of a diffraction phenomenon. So because there's diffraction, therefore, you're going to get constructive destructive waves, in other words, an interference effect. Um, so this is the key. If you understand this sentence, you understand microscopy. And um, let's just, let's go over it again. In class, I actually have everybody say it together a few times. So let's you and me say it together. Let's literally sync your voice up, speak out loud. Don't just say it in your head, okay? Uh, find a place where you can say it out loud and um, say it out loud with me. We're gonna go over it a couple of times. The microscope image is the interference effect of 
a diffraction phenomenon. Let's go again. The microscope image is the, diff the interference effect of a diffraction phenomenon. Good job, one more time. The microscope image is the interference effect of a diffraction phenomenon. Yay, you have it. <laughs> so there's, that's the, you know, answer to life, all the mysteries of life, interference effect of a diffraction phenomenon. And you get a microscope image and you can resolve things you can't otherwise see. And we know that life is everywhere and there's um, so much knowledge to be gained by looking at interference effects of diffraction phenomena. They're so beautiful, really. All right, so that was fun. Carrying on, take a little stretch break, pat yourself on the back, you got this, you know, nice symmetry to this semester. We started out with um, scopes are about resolution. Now I think you're finally understanding what that means. And um, <laughs> let's take a deeper dive because you still, you got to meet one of the, the three most exciting concepts of this lecture already. So that, that's Abby's, um, let me just go back in a sec. Notice that it's Abby's theory of image formation. Does that mean, remember the research design, I mean, scientific method lecture? Here's a theory that I was going to say, does that mean that we don't know if it's so? No, this is a science theory. That means well, actually physics, biology, whatever. Um, this means this is something that's really well proven and really important. Okay, so Abby's theory of in, info image formation is one of the key pieces of information in this portion of the class. You're also going to learn about airy disks and about NA. Those are your three best friends, really. <laughs> if you understand airy disks, NA, and Abby's theory of image formation, you got microscopy. The rest is details. Okay, so let's go on to meet our next friend, um, which is airy disks, or when a spot is not a spot, as I like to put it. So, okay, uh, we know that images happen because of diffraction, because <laughs> then you get an interference phenomenon, that's what you're looking at, um, or you get an interference effect from a diffraction phenomenon. So where is this diffraction happening, actually? <laughs> Who's diffracting stuff? What are the barriers? And um, the answer is two key places. One is you're getting diffraction happening inside your specimen. And two, and that's the sort of unknown exciting part that you can't control. Two, you're getting, you're getting diffraction, reflection, refraction absorption, you're getting all sorts of things happening in there. But two, the part that you can control is your objective. Oh, and also the condenser, but we're just going to focus on the objective. Your objective is not square, it is round. So a round diffraction pattern, I mean a diffraction through a round aperture, so something round, a round hole, is known as an airy disk. And this, by the way, is also how you see the world, because guess what else is round besides the object, I mean, the, yeah, the objective, right? The lens of the objective is round. It's not square, it's not triangular, it's not any other shape, it is round, it's perfectly round. Um, are there any other round openings <laughs> through which light passes? Of course, your eye, right? <laughs> so everything you see is actually also an interference uh, uh, pattern of a diffraction phenomenon. 
So an interference effect. So an airy disk is a particular kind of diffraction pattern that is produced when light tra travels through a circular opening or aperture, such as your objective or the pupil in your eyes. And what does it look like? Like this. There is a spot of light, but what you actually always see, <laughs> if you're, you with your own eyes have never ever seen a spot of light, never. It, you, you, it just cannot physically happen. Physics says you have never viewed a spot of light as it actually is because you've always, always viewed a spot of light by light through traveling through your eyes. And when it travels through your eyes, it's subject to um, diffraction and it becomes an airy disk. It becomes a spot with a darker circle and then uh, it's got fringes or stripes as I like to call them. But so there's the spot and there's the darker circle and then there's a bit of a brighter, circle and then there's some dimness and then some brightness some dimness and it kind of tapers down the brightest uh, part is the center of this airy disc um but you know it's not a spot you've never looked at a spot not with your eyes anyway maybe with you know your, your brain you know you can in fact your brain um this is called it deconvolutes um uh, it, that's called it it turns <laughs> your brain is the one that makes you that knows your singularity discs and says you know what i got this i i'm just gonna call that a spot when i see this pattern this one over here um let's see if you can see my mouse for some reason my mouse disappears when i'm doing this but basically you see this um you know bright spot with a bunch of uh, fringes around it your brain just goes Oh, I know about eyes. I know about pupils. I know about diffraction. I've got this. I'm going to show it out. I'm going to perceive it as just one spot. Okay, so your brain cleans up things for you, cleans up images for you. So does well, it does actually. Um, and if you don't use your eyes to see, uh, if you have uh, not full vision or something, um, you might be actually. <laughs> You might be actually seeing even more clearly if you're using only your brain uh, to uh, see things. Your every sense that we have is, you know, a sensory organ plus how the brain decodes that information that is sent to it by the sensory organ. And um, so, coming back to microscopes for a minute, I get excited about just vision because I'm, you know, it's a passionate interest of mine. Um, how we're able to see and um, tricks that our brain does <laughs> to allow us to see stuff. It's pretty amazing. Okay, ask me about it in office hours. But the decoding that our brain does is pretty phenomenal. In fact, you think you just see an image, but you actually map in your brain all the sharp angles in your uh, field of vision, all the movements to the left, all the uh, fat centers within uh, outskirts. You have your brain decodes that image and throws it into a million different images and then reconstructs an image. So your brain is ridiculously complicated when it comes to vision. Mine too. I mean, all our brains, not just yours. Um, <laughs> and any any uh, sense, any animal that has vision um, does some really astonishing tricks with it. And the microscope, by comparison, to be honest, is simpler. <laughs> because <laughs> it's just got a few objectives to deal with and maybe a camera. Anyway, so this is an airy disk. This is a point of light. It, just thinking about a point of light as it travels, um, it's just traveling along as a point of light. If it hits, um, you know, a square mesh, it's going to create that diffraction pattern I showed you earlier, or you can just forget about that pattern if it it confuses you. If it hits a round opening and it can't all go through at the same time, only some of it, it's going to fan out. And on the other side of that round opening, you're going to see this beautiful pattern that is known as an airy disk. Um, so you're looking on the left, it's an actual airy disk pattern that um, was captured and 
you might have when you start getting on scopes you might start recognizing this 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 happens in the scope if you're out of focus um or if there's out of focus dirt you'll sometimes see the airy discs um which is kind of cool so you're looking at this light sort of coming to you you're the camera if you will um what's happening over here on the right in the pink or red is just a drawing of the airy disc and it's a really useful one to look at so it's showing you um, it's representing intensity and um, it's showing you that that center circle of the airy disc is the brightest one and then there's a sort of stutter outwards if you will <laughs> you know where the next the next fringe um, or stripe but fringe, let's start calling them fringes. The next fringe is nowhere near as bright as that first central one, but it's there. And the second fringe is uh, also dimmer and the next one's dimmer and then, you know, it gets dimmer and dimmer. So this is, these are both an airy disc. This is a picture of an airy disc. And then this is a graphic on the right. There's a graphic representation of an airy disc. And here's another way to represent an airy disc. Um, as you can see, so airy disc picture of it, <laughs> kind of looking from the top. And then if you look over here, um, I apologize for my mouse not working, but um, if you look to the right, you'll see the, sort of the side view of the airy disc. And again, it's super bright in the middle, and then it sort of stutters out, like, right, there's a, or stripes, or or well they're fringes basically the first fringe is the brightest fringe the second fringe is dimmer the third one is dimmer the next one is practically non-existent and then I, I can't even see the last one on my computer and you can see it drawn above just showing you the intensity so there's a peak of intensity and then there's that first order fringe is let's call the first order fringe is it's the brightest of the fringes. I mean, it's not as bright as the air, the center of the airy disc, but it's there, <laughs> okay? It's there, it exists. And you turned what was a spot into an airy disc because you shone the light through a round opening, which was either your pupil of your eye, or in our case on the microscope, the round opening of the objective. And so, oops, I went backwards. Okay, so here's um, <laughs> here's the a little in blue a little drawing of an airy disc um, created by going through an aperture. This time the aperture is round. It's hard to show that in this kind of diagram. Um, and again, you're getting stripes, um, but uh, and and this is true with most diffraction patterns. The first stripe is the brightest or the middle stripe, and then there's these other fringes that are um, dimmer and dimmer until they're just, they don't exist. And this is all because of constructive and destructive interference. So an airy disk is an image. <laughs> it's an image of a spot is what it is. Um, and uh, so light through a point source passing through aperture diffracts and the aperture can be the eye or the objective. This is just repeating um, in different words, the same information. And here we come to PSF. So <laughs> the pattern of diffraction that you see um, due to constructive and in destructive interference. So this is a diffraction phenomenon with constructive and destructive interference. And the image of a spot of light is not a spot, not a spot, it's an airy disk. An airy disk is also known as a point spread function, PSF. And so when you come to the AIM conference next January or February, whenever it is, um, notice, you, and you may remember this from the AIM conference, um, notice that people are talking a lot about PSFs or sometimes they say airy disc. Uh, by the way, the recordings are supposedly up and if you didn't sign up, just ask me or a classmate, they can send you a copy of the recordings. So from the AIM conference. Okay, so back to Airy Disc and PSF. So um, for a few years at the AIM conference, I just randomly go around and ask people, PSF or Airy Disc, what's the difference? <laughs> I quit after a while because I got 10 different answers. Um, my best answer is that 
the sort of consistent answer is PSF is the mathematical representation of an airy disk, which to me is like, well, is that not the same? And they're like, well, it's the math. It's the, so I'm like, okay, one's the image and the other is the math that describes the image, fine. Um, and I think, I think, other things can have a PSF, although in microscopy, you're, if somebody says PSF, you're only going to be talking about airy disks because that's the kind of, um, that's what we deal with um, in microscopy. So it's sort of, it's another of those things used interchangeably. So PSF is the, the calculations that show you the airy disk. And so, okay, so why do airy disks matter <laughs> for two things? First of all, they're how you get the image in the first place. They're the image you're looking at. You're never looking at, just, well, unless you do it on purpose and you can, but um, you're not, I was going to say you're never looking at just a spot of light, but we actually calibrate scopes by using little bright um, beads that are sub-resolution. So they're basically a spot of light. <laughs> and we're like, okay, let's see how this, let, Let's see how our scope is distorting things today. Um, and we've had people do internships just imaging PSFs. Technically, you should, on the more advanced scopes like confocals and so on, before you start imaging, you should first image a PSF and then you should, um, you know, keep going basically. Um, just making myself a note. One of your guest speakers um, did that. So I'm going to ask, remind him to talk about that. So um, usually you're not looking at just a spot of light. You're looking at a lot of light, a lot of spots of light. And they're all, they're all airy disks, not spots, because they've all gone through the objective. And um, they are each airy disk is light experiencing uh, constructive and destructive interference with itself in order to give you that airy disk pattern. But then airy disks interfere with each other and your image <laughs> is the interference of airy disks with each other, <laughs> okay? So light is self-interfering in the airy disk itself and then those that light is actually interfering with other airy disks. Okay, so there's just a lot of interference, and good thing it's just either destructive or constructive and straight up, you know, plus and minus. But um, this is more than we could calculate, right? Thank God that the scope just does it for us, and it presents us with this beautiful image um, that is a bunch of PSFs interfering with each other, and because we want good resolution, we are trying to have them not interfere too much with each other, okay? So it, it, like airy disks are the image, they create the image, diffraction is the image, it creates the image. Um, and at the same time, we kind of want to separate, you know, we kind of want to get rid of the airy disk. We would prefer if we could just see a spot of light, um, but we can't. Um, and so we mess with the airy disks as much as we can, because we know they're there. Um, we, we're sort of, we're actually, the part we're messing with is not the airy disks coming from your specimen. They are what they are, and that's information. We're trying to make the airy disk that, um, airy disks that are created by your objective, we try to get that minimal. So in that way, they affect resolution, okay? So airy disk matters because, well, they created the image, but also they create, um, they mess up your image and they give you less resolution. And so we wanna fight that. And we actually want our airy disks to be as small as possible. That's the goal in life, really. Now that you've met an airy disk, you're like, oh, I love you. Thank you for giving me, thank you for being everything I see. <laughs> uh, but could you be smaller, please, <laughs> if you're on a microscope? Because the smaller the airy disk, the better the resolution, the spatial resolution. So there's resolution like in time and so on. Uh, what we're talking about here is resolving two points. 
And if there are two points of light, we'd like to actually honestly be able to see it as two points of light, separate points, right? That's resolution. Um, not as just one point or one, we're not sure, one streak of light or something. It's basically everything you're seeing is less sharp than it really is. I think this is, I, it amuses me, this is really profound. And actually, when I was at Woods Hole in the class, the um, one of the lectures on this, <laughs> this is a totally atheist scientist, um, said um, basically, the only way you'll ever be able to see anything as sharp as it really is, is to have an have no aperture or an infinitely large aperture for your eyes. And he went like, you know, imagine the eye of God or something. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> I thought you were atheist because he because I know, but um, I think I personally think that's a poetic kind of way of looking at it. So, if you had an infinitely big eye, you could see everything as uh, resolved as possible. You would have you would be able to see the cells when you look on your skin. You would have such good resolution and such sharpness and so on. But you don't. Um, but you know, we still have pretty great vision, um, and our microscopes are still pretty great. Um, but they, we do have to contend with airy discs on, in life, you just, your brain just goes, eh, good, you know, I'll figure it out. I'll sharpen things out for you. And um, on the scope, we do it by having good objectives. And then we also do it um, through math, <laughs> through legit real math um, later. Um, I'll talk about that in the next lecture, actually, what we do um, to, you know, once we have the image, how, you know, just like our brain cleans it up, um, we can also do that. It's called deconvolving. I sort of mentioned that before. But coming back to airy disks themselves, we want small airy disks. That's what we want. Because here's the thing. Here's two spots of light next to each other. And um, on the top, you're looking at, at them next to each other as if you're, you know, they're coming at you like you're the camera, you're the sensor. And then um, in the middle there, you're seeing the graph of intensity. So there's two airy discs next to each other. And then below is just the illumination source. You can ignore that. But um, here's the thing. <laughs> Do you think you can tell that these two spots are two spots? When you look at the airy disk pattern, either from the side or from the top, either way, you can see that they're kind of running into each other. And um, I can tell you, we call this not resolved. You would say this is one spot. It will look like a little streak or a smear of light. So think fluorescence. You're trying to get a signal from your green fluorescent protein. And if there's two GFPs next to each other, are you gonna see them as two separate proteins or just a spot of light? Um, you're gonna see them as a streak of light. And you're gonna go, I guess that's a one protein. I don't know, I can't count proteins, but I can I can at least know that there is, there is some, I'm looking, I'm getting signal, yay, cool. But what if you wanted to count proteins? Or, you know, you wanted like, there, you've, you've got, um, let's say GFP labeled actin, for, you know, and you want to be able to tell shapes and you want to be able to tell when like the filaments, uh, are there two filaments next to each other or is it one fat filament? Are they crisscrossing each other? So where and how, above, below? You want resolution. <laughs> and so um, sometimes you can live with low res and in other words, big fat airy disks right next to each other and you can't tell them apart. But sometimes you want high res, in which case we'll look at the same spot, same distance apart. But in this case, their airy disks are much, much, much smaller. Um, and oh my gosh, I can resolve these two. I can see that it's two molecules really close to each other, but I can see that they're they're two different molecules. Because look, they're <laughs> they're um, their fringes are kind of interfering with each other, but not so much, not so bad, okay? So skinny airy disc, yay, much better. Well, how do we, okay, so that was um, new friend number two. So new friend number one, Abby's theory of image formation, new friend number two, airy disc. 
new important friend number three that you've been hearing me sort of tease all semester, like I'll explain this to you at some day. <laughs> well, someday is now. <laughs> someday is the new, so finally it's here. I'm going to explain numerical aperture to you. So that's um, important friend number three or star of the day today, numerical aperture. So, and also, <laughs> What does it have to do with what I was just talking about? Okay, you'll see in a second. So what is the NA? First, let's define it. Um, it is actually a property of your objective, technically of the front lens. So the first lens that is the one that you're cleaning, <laughs> right? The one that you can, you can access and clean because your objective has a bunch of lens inside there depending on the objective. But the front lens is kind of the key one. Um, and it is the one that is gathering the light from your specimen. So your specimen, let's say that's a fluorescent um, protein, actually, that you're looking at. It's shining light in all directions. And you see this nice yellow green cone of light that they've drawn for you that's captured by the objective. What they're not drawing is the rest of the light that is just being lost. It's just going, light is going off in all directions from your specimen. And your goal in life is to not waste that light, but to capture as much as possible of it, especially with fluorescence where you don't have light to waste because things bleach and because they're dim and so on. You really wanna gather most of the light. And how do you do that? You have a good objective. Um, what is a good objective? Well, a good objective is one with a high and a numerical aperture so you see this cone of light oh come on pointer let's see if i can get you to work no it's just not gonna work but okay so we'll use words you see that little cone of light there uh, you want to have that cone be as fat as possible basically which you can do by bending the lens so it has to do with the curvature of the lens and also the quality of the glass and so on, but usually the curvature. It's a fixed thing. It's something you know about your objective and it is that way, period. That's the best your objective can do when, you know, if you haven't scratched it, if you've treated it well, there's a certain cone of light that it can gather in the best possible of conditions, it's gathering that whole cone of light. And, um, so there's a formula for this to figure this out. So that cone of light has an angle. So if you draw that line through it, then it's called a half angle and it can be 27 degrees. It can be 32 degrees. It could be 10 degrees. That would be not great, but <laughs> there's a number to it. We can put a number to it. Okay. The fat we want, we want more, the fatter it is the, that, you know, that cone of light is the better. We want all the light. Um, so theta here is the half angle of the cone of light, or also the cone of light is called the angular aperture. So half of the angular aperture. Um, so that's known as theta. And theta is that Greek letter there that looks like a zero with a line through it. Um, in the literature, I've noticed that for NA, um, people use pretty much any Greek letter for that cone of light. So it's not um, for that angle, the half angle. So it's not, it doesn't have to be theta. You might see it as alpha, beta, kappa. I don't know, this is it's random. It's basically um, some, some angle, a number. Um, and so this NA of your objective is that cone of light, that's important. Um, actually we use the sign of it as you can see up there, um, times the refractive index of what the light is traveling through. Specifically the refractive index of where that cone of light is, which is in between the cover slip and the front lens of the objective. So there's kind of usually just two things. It's either air or it's immersion oil, special, microscopy oil. Nowadays, there's some 
dipping objectives where you can dip them so it could be water. There's also uh, objectives that use glycerol instead of oil, but we're just gonna keep it simple. It's either the refractive index of air <laughs> or the refractive index of you know, specialty oil. So the NA is the refractive index of whatever is right there between your, <laughs> whatever the light is traveling through. So whatever's between your cover slip and the front lens times the sign of the angle of that angle of the light cone that you're gathering. Okay, so that this is an important equation. You haven't, we haven't really, I don't think we've memorized any equations yet, but this one is really fundamental. So NA, numerical aperture of an objective. So remember every objective has an NA. It's a thing that is fixed. It doesn't, there's one small way to change it, but well, you're not changing it. You're, well, anyway, uh, we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that later, but just think of it as a, it's a fixed property of your objective. Once you have that objective, that objective has an NA and it's the best you can do. Uh, you're always trying to get the best possible NA. You'll see why in a moment, but let's just look at objectives and NA for the moment. Okay, so the NA of an objective is uh, the refractive index times the sine of theta, the angle of the Kona light, half angle of the Kona light. So here's a cool thing about NA. So, Sine of theta, the most a sine of anything can be is one. If you have a 90, happen to have a 90 degree angle, which by the way, yeah, right. <laughs> it doesn't happen, but okay. <laughs> That's the best possible, you know, in theory, we could have an objective that good. Um, but uh, so, so that, that multiplier sine of theta is at most gonna be ever gonna be one. So what, what's gonna affect your maximum possible NA is the refractive index. And there's kind of only two situations we're simplifying. One um, is the one where air is in between your cover slip and your objective. And in that case, the refractive index of air is one. <laughs> So one times one is one. <laughs> so the maximum possible best NA you can have in a dry lens is one. So NA goes on a scale of point one, yeah, point, I mean, that's a really bad objective, but like point two, something like that up to maximum of, in real life, 0.95 or something like that. 0.8 is really, really, really good for a dry um, objective. Um, so if you have a 0.8, a dry objective, that's an exquisite NA on that objective. You can already tell, we don't, we don't look at mag on objectives, we look at NA. That is how, as a microscopist, you go, this is a good objective or a bad one. This is why, like, there's all these really cheap scopes available now on Amazon, and they're just terrible because they, they do have NAs of 0.1, or they don't even tell you. If they don't tell you, they're not a real scope in my mind. Anyway, a little bit of scope snobbery here, but you know, there's a reason behind it. Okay, so what about an oil objective, one that you use with oil? Well, the refractive index of oil is 1.515, let's just call it 1.5. And, um, you know, the sine of theta and most is one. So 1 1.5 times one is 1 1.5. So the maximum you could ever have on an objective, if it is an oil immersion objective, is going to be um, 1.5. But really, you never get that. I mean, there's, I've seen a claims of 1.46, so I put that on the slide. I don't know if they're really that good. Um, but, you know, anyway, up to 1.5. This is super handy because let's say you're at a scope and you don't know whether it's, um, you know, it's a 63X. It might be oil, it might not be oil. Do I need to use it with oil? <laughs> um, do you have to sit there and test it with and without oil? No, all you have to do is look at the NA, which is always, always, always written on the objective and go, oh, it's an NA of 1.2, guess what? 
I have to use oil. Anything over one and below 1.5 is an oil objective. It needs it needs um, oil basically. And if it's under one, then it's it's going to be a dry objective. Don't use oil with it. it says 0.8. No, it doesn't want oil. <laughs> Don't do it. Um, you'll mess it up. And if somebody's trying to sell you a scope with an NA of 1.7, call them on it. Like, don't believe them. It's not possible. <laughs> okay. Oh, my DNA is three. No, it isn't. <laughs> There's no such thing mathematically. Okay. So these are the NAs. Um, so it's a scale of technically, I don't know where the lowest end, but, you know, say 0.1 to 1 is. Um, dry lenses and used in air and above that up to 1.5 is oil immersion. Okay, so this is why people think high mag is good. Um, it's actually not the high mag that's helping you, it's the fact that the NA increases um, as you increase the magnification because you're actually increasing the curvature of the lens you're also um, decreasing the focal length, et cetera. Um, but what counts in what's happening is that your NA is getting better. So this is an example showing you that, um, you know, here's a lens with, if you look at the annotations, an NA of 0.12, and then here's a lens, I mean, objective with 0.3, and here's a really good one. <laughs> with 0.87, you know. Um, it just so happens that that correlates a, a bit and actually kind of strongly with magnification of the lens. Um, if you're curving the lens to get a better NA, you're also gonna end up getting a little bit more mag. And uh, as I said before, they like in this one, they call the um, half angle moo, that U. Um, so different, when you look this up, different folks will call that half angle different things, but we're calling it, and I mean, we're calling the equation n times sine theta. So we're calling it theta here. All right. Um, so read the objective. It will always tell you the NA. I never get to say always, oh, there's another. I never and always in the same sentence. So biology in particular, there's always, uh, <laughs> always oh, again, an asterisk. You know, by that I mean there, there's, biology isn't a hundred percent. Things happen most of the time, you're lucky, you know, you call that something that happens. <laughs> it's not like chemistry where if you add two things, you should always get the same answer. In biology, there's so many variables, but that saying always, only, never are actually hard to say in biology. Um, and you should be suspicious of any test answers or quiz answers that include those words. But in the in this case, I am pretty confident to say that um, your objective will always tell you the NA. I've never seen an objective without it. Now, if you want to find one and show me, I'd be interested. Um, and I'd probably be highly suspicious of whatever scope that's on also. But, but uh, I... I you always get extra credit points if you prove the teacher wrong, by the way, because this is a science class. And what we do as scientists is see what other people say and set to, we love to, we, we set to prove them wrong. We're like, that's kind of right, but you know what? That's not the full story. I'm gonna make, I'm gonna write a better version of that story. Um, you know, or we see something in the textbook and we go, no, that's not, that's not it. It's, that's just the beginning of things. I'm gonna look into this deeper. Okay, so anyway, on your objective, you will see, they will write the mag and right past that is the important thing. <laughs> the thing that we actually care about is microscopist, fly right past the mag, whatever, go for the NA. Because not all 20 X's have an NA of 0.4 as is shown on here, they might have a 0.2. Which one are you gonna pick? The 20 X with a 0.2 NA or the one with a 0.4? In this case, the higher NA is always better. There's no downside to it, except for literally the only downside is the cost because <laughs> they know it's better. They'll charge you more. 
Um, so that 10x there, it's just a point too. Good Lord. Uh, but you know, whatever, it's a 10x, it's fine. We'll live with it. Um, oh, I just I just cut these and I'm like 5x, there's a 0.13. Good Lord. That's you can barely resolve anything with that. Oh, I gave away the hint that obviously NA is gonna lead you to re resolution. I was trying to stay away from that, but I you probably already came to that conclusion yourself. Like, why are we so obsessed with an A? Why do we care? Well, because, you know, it's the key to resolution. It's the key to getting rid of pesky airy disks. Okay, so look on the objective. It'll tell you the NA. And again, if it says 1.2 or 1.3 or even, you know, 1.4, it's an oil immersion. If it says 1.4, you should dance for joy. These, there's like, the difference between a 1.2 and a 1.4 is huge because the, the range is tiny, right? <laughs> it's 0.1 to 1.5. So if you upgrade from a 1.2 to a 1.4, oh my God, you will see so much more stuff. It'll be so much better and also more expensive. Okay, so <laughs> ah, I, did, I did give it away here. So the higher the NA, the more resolving power. So the more resolution, basically, the more you can tell two spots apart from each other. And high mag objectives tend to have the highest NA. And that's why everybody's like, you say better with them. Well, you do, but it's not because of the mag. It's because the NA is better. And um, it is possible to have like a 63X, um, which has a higher NA than 100X, and the 63X is the better objective. In fact, that's a very common situation <laughs> because usually 63Xs are the magic objectives that everybody loves. Just because of the design and physics and so on, it's um, frequently so that the 63X is your actual highest NA uh, objective available to you on a scope. And um, microbiologists love 100x the rest of us are like our 63x is, is our magic spot okay so a high mag high oil uh, high mag oil objective is the one that is going to give you the best in a and therefore the best spatial resolution the most also a nice thing is uh, remember it's about the light it's capturing it's also going to give you the most brightness so if you're doing fluorescence microscopy you're going to notice it um, it will, there's trade-offs with everything. Um, it will give you less depth of field. Um, so that might be good, actually. Maybe that's what you want because you're on a confocal and you're doing optical sectioning, but sometimes that's not what you want. It just depends. It actually gives you slightly less contrast, but it sort of just depends. Um, and of course it gives you um, a smaller field of view, which is either good or bad, depending on what you're trying to see. So these are just trade-offs. Everything has a plus and a minus, um, you know, to it, pros and cons. And of course, the high mag oil objective is also going to cost the most. Um, if it's an oil objective, it's going to be the hardest to take care of because you have to clean it immediately. You put oil on it, the minute it, you, you know, expose it to your you got to clean it and people don't. And so if it's a shared scope, they, they end up being the most abused objectives, to be honest. And they get these little rocks of oil that scratch them. And so they don't have a long life on um, like shared scopes and things like that. Okay, so let's see, you've met the three, the three key players, the three friends sort of. Uh, Abby's theory of image formation, uh, airy disks and NA. So let's put it all together. Let's resolve this. Uh, I was kind of making a musical joke that's not working. Um, resolution is music is when you everything you've been taught that you've been hearing <laughs> comes to kind of gets tied up together and ends. So um, let's bring this all together. So resolution. Resolution is the ability to visually distinguish two real spots as two spots, not one. So in, in reality, there's two spots. You want to be able to see it as two spots. Again, resolution, not magnification. Reality, two spots. See them as one spot, then you're just going to make it one bigger spot when you magnify it. What we want is resolution enough to see two spots as two separate spots and then yeah make them bigger because you know whatever why not um you know we're gonna go into airy discs in a minute right 
um, let's just define some terms. Resolution is the ability to distinguish two nearby, two nearby objects as separate objects or two spots as two spots, like two spots of light. Resolution limit is the distance between these two objects that you can resolve. And anything below that, they're going to appear as one object. And the resolving power is um, it, it refers to your scope, basically. The ability of the scope to distinguish, to resolve things, to distinguish small separate objects as such. And um, the type of resolution that we're talking about is spatial resolution. And, and quite honestly, we use spatial to talk about the XY plane and then axial to use the Z plane, although that's in space too. And then there's temporal resolution, which is resolution over time. If you're taking a movie, um, how close can the two events happen? And you can see them as two events, or do they seem like it's one event? Um, because how often are you looking? Um, how often are you sampling your, your specimen? There's uh, spectral resolution, which is the ability to tell different colors from each other and so on. But um, what I'm talking about here is mostly the XY plane. And then we're going to talk a little bit about in the Z plane. So here's an example you've seen before, same scope, better resolving power on the one on the right. And so let's put it together. I keep saying NA is fantastic. <laughs> NA is what we want. NA is what we pay attention to. NA is what we obsess about. NA is what we'll walk a sample over to a whole different campus just to get a better, you know, use a better objective that someone else has. Um, how? How is this NA affecting resolution? Take a second to guess what's going to be involved, because you know. It's going to be airy disks, and it is airy disks. <laughs> okay. So the bigger the NA, the smaller the airy disk. Remember that eye of God, the infinite hole, you know, that's like not whole, basically. <laughs> if there were no edges, there would be no airy disks. So um, the bigger the NA, the more the light you're capturing, the bigger that cone is, that angle is, the fatter the cone. Um, the smaller the airy disk. And we like, so we like big NAs and small airy disks. Big NAs, small airy disks. Because a high number NA, like a 1.4, has a really tiny airy disk. And that means that things that are really close to each other are not going to run, their airy disks are not going to interfere and overlap with each other. And that is great. Okay, so here's two examples that you've seen before. Um, the one on the left has two spots with big fat airy disks because they've been imaged by something with um, a low NA. And in fact, this is from the uh, Davidson website. Again, you should have it linked by now, but if you don't, it, just Google Davidson microscopy. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I find it when I don't when I'm on a computer that I don't have it linked to. And you can play with this. And you know, I played with, I gave it a 0.1 NA, which I don't think anybody's even gonna sell you a 0.1 NA objective though these days. I don't know. Um, but you know, that's a big fat airy disc on that objective. And you just can't tell these spots apart. They're just merged completely. So not that good of resolution. If you bump it all the way up to 0.95, which is the max that this simulation would let me do, um, you know that that's a dry lens, right? And um, these spots are the same distance apart in real life, and it's the same color of light I'm using, and yet I can see them apart. Their airy disks are not merged. You know, they're fine. They're, the outer fringes are overlapping, but that's okay. And if you're going, that's kind of loosey goosey, don't worry. There's criteria. Okay. There's math behind this. This has been figured out. Um, there's a cutoff. There's a, there's a way we can say, yes, that is resolved, and no, that isn't. But right now, just take in the fact that. Um, if you have 
a low and a you're gonna have a big airy desk and you can live with it if you have to i mean it's fine you're still seeing things i mean it's still cool like you, you still might be able to answer your questions but you know if you can <laughs> go with the uh, go with the smaller airy desk and nowadays like a scopes um a lot of scopes are digital a lot of scopes have motorized stages what you can do and is actually a big area of employment is take the whole take an image of the whole specimen so this is in digital pathology this is happening right um you want to take an image of the whole specimen with your highest DNA objective and then just stitch it together so maybe you can get the whole specimen even maybe if it's tiny let's just say which isn't going to happen so much in histo but let's just say your specimen is so tiny you can see the whole thing under 4x should you take an image is that your image you're going to take um well take it because you should always take images <laughs> but is that your best image no um then go all the way up to uh, your 63x your magic 63x uh or you know whatever the one or if it's 100x on your scope fine your oil immersion with the best na that you have on the scope let's say you have an na of 1.2 on that scope so go to that objective now take take image the whole specimen now your field of view is much smaller so you're going to have to make a, a series take a series of images and have the software stitch it together for you and that's called a montage um and um you know if it's 10 images no biggie but often we're doing this for uh, like there's hundreds of images stitched together for a specimen and of course, if you start going in Z, then there's thousands, and then there might be thousands of specimens. So what we're ending up with these days is a lot of data and a lot of need for techs who know how to manage that data and know how to do image stitching and so on. And actually, um, Feather, myself, and Ben Smith are writing a chapter on this for a textbook because it's such a big field that it gets its own chapter. Um, so, Yes, so basically coming back to this always always go for the highest NA if you can possibly it's just going to be better resolution. Um, because it has a small airy disk big NA, small airy okay so again here just reinforcing the airy gets smaller as the resolution gets bigger and the mag gets bigger as the resolution gets bigger. And the NA gets bigger. So what's getting going from low mag to high mag, you go, you get more mag, you get a bigger NA, you get better resolution because you're getting a smaller airy disk. And there's a little tutorial. That's where I found it. And so just reinforcing this concept because it's really important. It's putting it all together. How do we get a smaller airy disk, which we is what we want for better resolution? We get an object, we buy <laughs> or find a friend. <laughs> um, we basically obtain an objective with a higher NA. That's how you're gonna get your airy disk smaller. Once you have the airy disk. Uh, or the objective the airy disk is what it is well <laughs> then there's that asterisk right <laughs> you, you've basically by choosing your objective you've chosen the best possible um airy disk you could ever have you can't go beyond the best airy disk that that objective can give you you can you can throw away resolution but you know there's only so much resolution that objective could possibly give you in the best possible circumstances. Now you can mess it up <laughs> by having a dirty scope, by having the wrong, you know, not immer not putting, not adding oil when it's an oil objective. There's a lot of things you can do to throw away resolution, but um, you can't go past the resolution that the NA of the scope gives you. I say that and then I'm like, oh, geez, there's all these people are working on that right now. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> that was true until about five years ago. <laughs> and then there was all these people coming in with physics and math to solve this problem. So you can, but it started, but it's not simple. Let's just put it that way. So you can, but generally speaking, don't expect to. Okay, axial resolution. I've been speaking about XY resolution, but you know, basically everything I said is true for axial resolution. So there's um, there's your PSF, um, you know, and what you really see as a smudge. Ideally, it would be a spot because you kind of know it's just one molecule. It should be a spot of light. It shouldn't be a smudge of light. Um, and you, what you're seeing on the top is what it looks like in um, X and Y, right? So we see a smudgy spot, but on almost all scope. So you can see that, you know, what you're seeing because of airy disks basically and NA um, isn't quite what the ideal is. This is literally an image of a round bead, right? A small round bead. And so, <laughs> You know what it should be. You know, you can look under an electron microscope and verify this is a small round bead. <laughs> it's perfectly round. And then you see it on the scope, and the best you can see is a kind of ovally smudge. And, um, you know, it's not even showing. Okay, well, um, that's an X and Y. If you try looking at it in Z because you're doing a confocal, you've got a confocal and you can look in Z, actual resolution is horrible on microscopes horrible. So <laughs> what you're going to see is a smudge that is really long with, and it's not showing up, but the fringes show up as sort of wings on the top and bottom. But basically here at this point in the course, just know that axial resolution is a huge problem. And um, in fact, the people who I just said who are inventing new microscopes and new math and new image processing software, you know, after you get the data to clean it up, um, they're mostly trying to work on this actual resolution problem because even on the best scopes our actual resolution is always worse in z than it is on x and y for a variety of reasons and um you can use math to go so this is where like you take an image on your scope and you go my scope with this objective gives me this kind of a shape of you know for a spot it, it, it thinks this is what a spot looks like on my scope. And you can use math to, it's called deconvoluting. And um, there's scopes that are sold as decon scopes, but in reality, it's just software that you can use on any image. It's always legit as long as you know what the PSF looks like on your scope. And you can just use math to sort of take out the smudginess and to take out the airy disk and to reassign that light to a point source. Um, so yay math and yay software that uses math. It's a total legit transformation. Um, one of the guest speakers this semester will actually show you how to do some of that. But you, um, you sort of ideally have to know what your scope is doing, but they've also done this enough that they can give you sort of a general stand in, like probably given your scope, your NA, this is what your PSF looks like. And then you can go from there. All right, so this is showing you some um, different PSFs actually, so NC of different scopes. So a wide field scope, just it's, it's hopeless. It's like trying to get uh, actual resolution out of a wide field is like, don't try. Why? Um, that's why lasers, laser scanning confocals were invented. So confocals were invented and actually multi-photon scopes too. Um, it, they have better axial resolution, but still it's actually not as clean as this drawing. It's just an ideal actually. <laughs> okay, so that's it for the big stuff. Let's just finish this off to be complete. Let's polish this with some of the uh, sort of important details, if, if you will, around this. But again, the big three is at, for this lecture is Abby's theory of image formation, what's an airy disk, and what is an A, and how are an A and airy disk related, basically. Because if you understand airy disks and an A, you know that they are, they, the point of an A, 
is to minimize. The point of getting uh, an objective with higher NA is to minimize the airy disk in order to have better resolution. There you go. So um, when do we call something resolved? Remember I said that um, you know, it's been decided. <laughs> like you don't have to decide if two spots are resol resolvable or not. Um, there's something called the rally criterion after the person named rally. And this was like a long time ago too. Um, and this, by the way, a lot of this has to do with, um, there's kind of fields of math and engineering where they think a lot about signal and resolution and things like that. So we get this from them. So the rally criterion is that um, you, you can scooch two airy disks kind of close to each other. It's okay if the third, fourth, fifth fringes overlap. We can resolve that. But um, you got to stop when they're overlapping that first diffraction ring. So not the spot merged. No, no, of course. The central spot, no, of course that's not resolved. And um, if you're overlapping that first diffraction ring, uh, you can resolve it basically. So, and the distance known as DRR is equal to the radius of the airy disk. So here's a picture basically. So um, this one on the left, that's fine because the center spots are separate, even though the first order fringe of the, both the darkness and the light uh, fringe, they are overlapping, but um, we still say that's resolvable. We can resolve that. If the center, the brightest part of the airy disk, the center uh, brightest part is overlapping, no, <laughs> no way, that's too close, that is just too close. So you can let the fringes overlap basically is what this is saying, it's okay. Um, but you can't let that central brightest uh, disk overlap. But the little fringes, the little stripes as I was calling them a while ago, um, yeah, they can overlap. That's okay. And the distance between the center of the airy disks is your limit on a particular scope. So you can have a scope, you can know the NA, and you can just post next to the scope what the result, the resolution is for each objective and for each color, actually. So um, we use the Rayleigh criterion to define the best possible resolving power for an objective. Okay, so it's the best of, you know, again, if everything's clean, etc. And um, so here's the resolving power. Here's another really useful equation. The resolving power, so the distance between the centers of those two spots, is 0.61 times, notice this, the wavelength, so it's color dependent, divided by, oh, the NA of the objective, <laughs> okay? So this is shows you that, um, you know, basically uh, the, 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 how important NA is, okay, in this. Because 0.61 is not gonna change. It's, it's always true, it's just in there. It has to do with the geometry of circles. And um, you're trying to get, you're trying to get D to be nice and fat, <laughs> right? We want, I mean, uh, you want, sorry, the opposite. You want D to be small. You want it, um, you want D to be, you want things to be able to be close to each other. So you want D to be small. You get D to be small by having a nice fat of NA. The bigger the NA, the smaller D is going to be. And so, you know, that's great because the bigger your NA, the bigger, the smaller the airy disk is and the closer things can get to each other. And notice that it's wavelength dependent. And um, so this is this is something that you can just go up to scope, look at the NA, and go for this color of light. I on this scope using this objective, the best possible resolution I can ever get is let's say 100 nanometers apart, or 200 nanometers apart. We do. We do a general thing. I've told you several times, like the best possible resolution on optical scopes for X and Y is somewhere, and then I tell you something different each time, but I usually say 200 nanometers to 250 nanometers. <laughs> um, you might have noticed. Um, well, that is basically uh, with about 
if you put it all together, the best possible um, NA that exists and the best possible wavelength, the one that's best at resolving, and that is blue light. So blue light with the, so if you take um, 400 divided by 1.5, basically, um, you get that sort of 200 nanometers is the best we can do on, you know, in an optical scope. But in, in truth, we're really, in real life, we're working in 500 nanometers and things like that. I mean, you have to be super, super everything set up just right to get even to get to the you know best possible scenario so um the resolving power again is 0.61 times the wavelength of the light see they're like what is the color of the light well often you're using a variety of colors so you just do the average of the colors or whatever that's a tricky one too um and then divided by the na of the objective the quick real world approximation that we do if like we're at a scope and nobody's bothered to put up a nice chart next to it of like these are the objectives we have and this is their best resolving power with you know blue light green light right you know with these different colors of light um just in our own sort of quick real world approximation we go um 400 <laughs> we go divided by two so for instance i kind of go let's say it's uv light but really really what you're looking at with fluorescence it's not going to be 400 it's going to be 500 so 500 divided by two by an na of let's just say one because i don't know what you're using that comes to 250. that's where i get that 200 to 250 <laughs> and why I say something different often so in the 200 range because in truth you're probably good luck if it's 300 or 400 you'll be happy um, like the resolving distance. If you can tell that things that are 400 nanometers are apart, you're doing good. Um, so again, the real world quick approximation is instead of remembering 0.61, because our brains usually, most of us can't, most of us are gonna have to pull out a calculator, sad but true. We just go, um, instead of 0.61, we do 0.5. So half of the wavelength of the light and then times the NA of the objective. Um, I mean, the whole thing divided by the NA. So half the wavelength also divided by the NA. There is a condition. So this one, I want you to know this quick world, well, real world one, and even better if you know the real one, <laughs> to be honest. This is the resolving power. Here's a great way to impress people at your job is like make that chart. <laughs> Although it might, it might upset some people because they might be like, I thought it was better, um, but oh well. Um, so um, anyway, there's, again, the real equation, the quick, you know, on the fly equation, because um, our minds are so full, we're like, I don't quite, what was it, 0.6, what? Okay, half, half of the wavelength, and then divided by the NA. The, this scenario was, uh, in the case of the condenser NA being um, the same or better than the objective NA, which is what usually happens. Um, you might have realized the condenser is also going to have an NA because it's also a circular opening. And sometimes, um, hopefully not, but it can occur that the condenser NA is not as good as the objective's NA. And on some scopes, sometimes you have to actually play with like various elements to put the, um, actually on our zyscopes, you have to play around with the condenser to match it to the objective NA. Um, so the minimum resolved distance, in that case, you got to, has a different equation because you've got to involve the NA of the condenser. So you add those two together and that's 1.22 wavelengths divided by the two NAs. And, um, I'm not gonna have you memorize this, but it's just more understand the concept that if your condenser NA doesn't match your objective NA, if it's less than, you might notice this is less than or equal to, and that's like, how careful do you wanna be? But really if it's less than is when people use it. Um, so here's the thing. Well, when you don't use oil on an oil lens, you're throwing away um, resolution, you're throwing away your NA that you paid for, for and, we're so excited to get on this great objective. Um, another thing, going back to your first lab that you had on the Meiji scopes, when you're coloring, I said, close down the iris diaphragm at will. Like just look in your 
specimen and um you know for every specimen pick do you want the iris diaphragm fully open or fully closed well fully closed gives you a lot of contrast but you're throwing away uh, resolution how are you throwing away resolution here's how you're doing it you're changing the na so you're creating a situation like the one on this slide where um the condenser na is no longer matching the objective na and you're basically this is the math behind um, that statement of you're getting less resolution so you you can have a setup that has max resolution given that you're using light given that you've got the na's that you've got on your objectives and then there's a million ways to end up with a lot less resolution than that in real life um, conditions and one of them can be intentional you can intentionally say in this situation i need contrast more than i need the best resolution and that's fine that's why you, the human user makes a lot of decisions on the scope right Okay, another thing, don't fall for uh, all these ads, the uh, advertising cheap scopes promise like some ridiculous amount of mag, which is insane because it's, there's no such thing. <laughs> there's to, like, there's something literally called empty magnification. Um, yeah, you might be wondering, why don't we have more than um, 100x objectives? Well, because we can't get more than a 1.5 NA, and um, really anything past that is, is empty mag. It's not real. There's no real info. So rule of thumb is, um, you know, uh, total mag shouldn't be more than, let's say, a thousand times the NA of the objective. The NA of the objective is one-ish, 1 1.2, 1.5, really. It just, also, you can't make lens in all the possible mags. You'll notice there's certain mags that it's just the making of the lens. And so uh, 150X, it, it, I haven't seen anything real. <laughs> that is, a, you know, so really, um, 100x that's the most that in the current uh state of you know physics that we live in that's the most you can get out of um there's no objective beyond that that's worth it so more on an eight so <laughs> i did say this so here's an example uh, this is a really good example, and I think your book has, um, if you refer to it, has a nice little table of this. Um, it, this to me, this example is more about showing you the power of NA, that, you know, be obsessed with NA, <laughs> because big NA is small airy disks, and that means better resolution. So it's better to have a high NA than it is to have magnification, because Here's, two, here's a great example that's actually fairly common. A 63X objective that has a 1.4 NA, which is typical for the best top of the line um, objectives that you find out there. When you pull it through the resolution equation, um, it, it, it can tell things 250 microns apart. And I think, I think this is for blue light that I, uh, that, this is the best possible scenario. So 200.24 microns, which is 240 nanometers. Um, compare it to 100x, which for reasons of physics and making the objectives, they often have uh, a 1.3 NA. So remember, these are both oil objectives, right? Because um, they're both above one. So these are both oil objectives. But your 63x oil objective happens to have, well, you know, on purpose has the best possible NA um, that one can manufacture, which is 1.4, or one of the best possibles. Um, whereas typically 100X will have a 1.3 NA. And that resolution is 260 microns, best case scenario. Now, it's a small difference, let's be real, 240 versus 260, I mean, not microns, nanometers. So, um, but if you're on a confocal or something and you're really trying to do some real work, um, it can make a difference. 
And again, this is the best possible resolution you could get out. And nowadays people are finding all sorts of workarounds. There's different scopes, there's different, using different light, using, you know, the light sheet, of course, has better resolution. There's a lot going on hitting at this resolution limit. So super resolution is the entire field of saying, we can use light, but we can get, um, instead of saying the best possible resolution on a light microscope is 240 uh, micron, I mean, uh, nanometers, I'm sorry, I read the microns and then I say, so 240 nanometers, um, we can get down to 25 nanometers on a light microscope. That has happened. Um, Eric Betzig, who is now at Berkeley, won a Nobel Prize for it. And it's something called light sheet microscopy. And they use a light, a sheet of light instead of a point source of light, which um, actually ends up in giving you better resolution, basically. Long story short, it's a little hard to work with, but um, the fantastic microscopes. Okay, um, come back in two years, we're gonna build one <laughs> actually at Merritt because you can actually, he, he open sources this so we can actually build one. All right, so NA is important. That was the point of this. Oh, NA also um, affects depth of focus. So actually depth of focus is a function of NA. Um, so it's the refractive index times the wavelength divided by the NA squared. So the NA really affects depth of focus, just so you know. Here is a summary of resolving power, um, ironically chosen with a background that allows you to not to resolve those words very well, right? <laughs> Reminder that resolution is everything. So resolving power depends on wavelength of the probe. Is it, are we using light or electrons? If light, what color? The NA of the lens in the system. And then the other things too. So, you know, this is gonna, the um, wavelength and, and so on, um, and the refractive index of the materials, the correct oil are gonna give you the best possible uh, resolution. But then, like I said, you can throw it away. For instance, if you have a bad quality detector and it can't detect your signal, then all of that was for nothing. And of course, you have to stain your image well and prepare it well. And in real life, when you're sitting at a scope, there's a lot of things that cause you to throw away resolution. And so, um, or, you know, maybe you've closed down the iris diaphragm for some reason. Um, so always try to find the best possible NA and on um, your objective and start as strong as you can because you know that in real life, um, also dirt anywhere in the system can mess up um, your resolution, your image and everything. Um, you know, know that in real life, it's never gonna be as perfect as, as physics says it could be. Uh, well, sometimes though, I mean, sometimes if you spend a lot of time working on it. And I've already said this, that closing the iris diaphragm decreases the NA of the condenser. So that's the trade-off between contrast and resolution. And um, because of that, uh, a lot of books and videos will say general starting point is two thirds open, whatever, like know your specimen and then know, like, am I gonna need contrast? Am I gonna, or I'm gonna keep this fully open um, so that you have better, uh, NA, more resolution, but less contrast, less depth of focus. Um, and this moving of the iris diaphragm is considered by a lot of people a step in coloring, but you know, I sort of consider coloring just putting the condenser in the right place, <laughs> X and Y and Z. And then you're doing this part all the time, but you are setting up the light path. So yeah, it's coloring along with aligning the lamp. Um, and uh, again, I've said this, but just to rephrase it and, and you know, why do people love high mag objectives? Because they have better resolution. You're gonna work with it. You're gonna be like, this objective is amazing. Well, it has better NA. It has a higher NA and a smaller airy disks, that's why. And the light limits of resolution. Um, so like I've been saying, the blue wavelength is sh the shortest, so it's gonna have the best resolution. Um, and um, so light in general, I'm going with 200 nanometers on this slide, as you see, and I sometimes will say 250, it just depends. And um, as I've said, there are lots of people working really hard to get around the limits of light resolution. And of course, electrons are, you know, a few nanometers. So they're like five nanometer res resolving power, whereas, 
um, we're, we're really in the 500, you know, half a micron, to be honest, that's lovely on most cases. So that's 500 nanometer resolution. Um, and the super resolution techniques take us down, believably or reproducibly at this point, this has been established down to, in the right hands, down to 25 nanometer resolution. Um, so things that are 25 nanometers apart from each other, they're that close together, but they can still be uh, distinguished in your microscope as two separate entities, which is pretty amazing. And you can tell it when you go out and look for light sheet microscope movies, and you can just see, like, you're like, oh my God, things aren't blurry. I, I, I'm just seeing so. I, I, when I first, the first time I, I heard Eric talk, um, was at a conference a long time ago and we all he was kind of unknown then we all came out with just our minds blown we're like we're finally seeing what we've been imagining all this time we felt like our scopes even our best scopes we're kind of looking through things blurry and kind of going okay in my mind i think that's two fibers you know and then you get his image and it's like oh my gosh this is exactly what i was in my brain sort of taking that blurry image and going, I bet it's this, and there it is. Uh, you know, his, the light sheet images are amazing. They're hard, they're hard to work with, but they're amazing what you can see. And then, oh yeah, this is, you, these are extinct, extinct now, but there was a time when uh, Blu-ray DVDs were like so the thing, and it's because it's hard to get a blue laser, but blue lasers have more resolution. So if you're scanning the disc with a blue laser, you get high res images on your TV and so on. All right, that is it. I'm gonna go back to this resolution is probe dependent part. That is it. So I hope you have learned um, what a microscope image is. That's Abby's theory. And I hope you have learned that uh, high N8 gives you a teeny tiny skinny airy disc, which gives you the best resolution possible. And enjoy the rest of your week.